Good morning to everybody. We want to welcome you to our last Moran Eye Center Grand Rounds of the academic year. We're really pleased that you're here with us, those of you that are here in person, as well as our virtual audience. And we're going to cap off the end of the year with a global ophthalmology focused Grand Rounds. This is going to be a little bit different style today. Uh, we're going to do some question and answers. We're going to also do some highlights for our division. I think some of you have some questions about the function of how the Moran Eye Center's Global Outreach Division works. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of detail, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how partnerships are so vital to what we do. And uh, we'll be having a very nice feature with Bilal Khan to talk about uh, how partnerships work and how we partner with industry to make uh, global ophthalmology work. These are my financial disclosures, uh, none of which are relevant for this topic. And I just wanted to share with you that we, in fact, have a mission and vision statement for our, our division. And our vision is really the Moran Eye Center's global uh, uh, institutional vision that no person with a blinding condition, eye disease, and or visual impairment should be without hope, understanding, and treatment. But specifically for the Moran Eye Center's global outreach division, our mission is to establish and support sustainable eye care solutions that empower individuals and in at-risk communities worldwide. And we do that through a variety of activities. And these are the activities that we primarily focus on. Building collaborative partnerships. Those can be with individuals, with academic institutions or entities. Teaching and training programs for all eye care professionals, not just surgeons, but including medical students, technicians, nurses, et cetera. Advocacy work is something that we, I would say, is the area that we've been the least involved in, but an area that we are putting more and more effort into, particularly for uh, global blindness issues. Research and finally, delivery of high quality eye care. So we invite you, if you don't know where our space is, we're down here on the first floor and we invite you to come. And we know many of you participate in our activities and we're grateful for that. Uh, we are nearly 100% donor based in terms of our funding, uh, but we also rely on our volunteers. You're really the backbone of the work that we do here and throughout our community as well as globally. Um, so with that, we're going to now transition over into our keynote presentation for today. Um, I'd like to invite Bilal Khan to come up here up front. Uh, Bilal is the CEO of New World Medical, one of the premier glaucoma companies working in this space. And his talk is going to be on evolving global ophthalmology efforts. Uh, Bilal did his undergraduate degree um, at the University of Wisconsin. Go Badgers, right? Yeah. And uh, we know we have a number of them in the, in the audience, and some are heading there uh, soon. Uh, also, he completed his MBA at the Bourne School of Business. And uh, one of the interesting things that we're going to get into a little bit later is that his degree is in actuarial science. Um, I didn't know about actuarial science until probably about 15 years ago, and it's uh, a really fascinating area, I think, for people who want to see the world through numbers and uh, understanding risk, et cetera. So we'll get a little bit into that and how that uh, shapes his perspective as leading this company. So with that, Bilal, uh, we invite you to the podium here to give your talk, um, and then we'll have some time for question and answer. So we invite those of you that are here in the audience, we have we will have microphones to pass around into our, for our audience. And those of you that are joining us on Zoom, we invite you to submit your questions as well. Bilal, thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks, Dr. Shia, and thank all of you for the opportunity to sort of share our story today. Um, you know, I was uh, reconnecting with Lori, and I, we came six years ago, I think, in 2017. We came to visit you guys and learn from um, how you were evolving, and and basically, today is going to be a transparent talk about how what we've done, how our thinking has evolved. We're still finding our way, so we're looking to. I look at today as an opportunity for some thought partnership and feedback. Um, we're looking to improve, so uh, we're not necessarily um, get affirmations, but uh, but any opportunities or or, or um, ideas are welcome. So feel free um, afterwards to ask questions or or give comments. They're also welcome. So my financial disclosures: the primary one that's relevant is I'm CEO of New World Medical. Um, I'm also involved with a couple of startups. Uh, one um, Spyglass Pharma, which is a drug delivery IOL and another um, eye tracking uh, technology to diagnose traumatic brain injury. Um, so those aren't really relevant. So just to give you a snapshot of our organization really briefly, um, because I think the context uh, matters when you're making decisions and, and we're lucky with a very unique context. 
So we're a closely held organization, and I'm going to go into depth about that. But I think that that has empowered us to um, be mission driven in a little bit of a different way than other organizations. We have a different type of freedom, I think, and, and it's, a, it's a privilege to, to have that. Um, we're also, we also have demonstrated R&D capabilities. I think that, that also speaks to our ownership structure. Um, and um, that's allowed us to build out a comprehensive glaucoma surgical portfolio. Uh, because we started from an R&D base and we continue to launch products into that space. Um, and we have about 200 plus employees and we have a direct sales presence in the U.S. and then internationally we sell through partners. But to get back to the why we exist, because I think this is, this is why um, I just feel very honored to be part of this organization. And, to, and I didn't get my job through merit. I was an actuary for nine years. Um, so that's not how you usually become a, a leader in a medical device company. I got my job through marriage. So uh, 18 years ago, I married my wife, who's uh, the founder's daughter. And, um, and I think Dr. Ahmed waited five years and then he asked me to take over the business. So I think he first wanted to test me out a little bit. So 13 years ago, he asked us, we were living in the UK, um, I was working there and he asked me to come back and take over the business. And um, that context is really important because uh, Dr. Ahmed is a unique individual. Um, I always make this joke, and I think people at the company are probably sick of it, but it's true. Uh, he's, he's driving like his sixth red minivan, and, like, and he, he basically gardens all day now that he's um, mostly retired. Uh, but as long as we can afford red minivans and like an opportunity to get whatever he needs from the gardening store, uh, we're good with our investors. And I think that's unique. I think that like um, other organizations, not better or worse, but just different. They have a different type of cap table that sort of orients them to different types of objectives where Dr. Ahmed's always been um, uh, very pragmatic, I think, um, in what he, what he wants from us, but also not necessarily prescriptive. Uh, so when I joined the organization, the first thing he, he told me was, you can't sell my business. So I think he thought this guy's coming from a finance background. So what he's going to do is he's going to come take the family's business and just sell it on. So I was like, okay, fair enough. I, I, I won't sell your business. And he, then he's, that, so I said, well, what, what do you want me to do? And he's been very unique as a mentor in that he, um, he, he doesn't give advice. Like, and I, and I, I've struggled with that. He's given me context, but he's, he never gives me actually advice about decision-making. And, um, and the reason for that, he says, is uh, he doesn't want me to become dependent. He needs to give me space to make my own mistakes. And that's the only way that we're going to grow as an organization, which I think is unique for a founder that sacrificed so much of his, um, his well-being actually to create the business. Um, so when he founded the business in 1990, he had a couple of partners and there was some context around the regulatory environment. And um, for folks that are older like myself, you'll remember there was a breast implant scare in the early 90s. So nobody was investing in, um, in silicone implants. So he wasn't able to raise funds. Um, so that was really trying for him to be able to found the company. But he was very, um, he was very, he, he was very determined. and was able to do it with the help of uh, a number of, actually, academics across the country, including Dr. Crandall here, who um, ran the trial for our Ahmed valve uh, with little or no support from the company because we just couldn't afford it at the time. But that unique sort of founding story allowed Dr. Ahmed to actually buy back the business, and it's wholly owned by the family now. And that's what's really empowered us. I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty harrowing journey for him, but for us, it's a privilege. So I asked him, I was like, look, you told me I can't sell the business. So what does that mean? What do you want me to do out of the business? Because you're not looking to get a, you know, a richer yield out of it. And, and it sounds a little corny, but I think if you meet Dr. Ahmed, then he'll be at the academy. He doesn't travel as much anymore. Um, it's, it's authentic and he drips with authenticity. And basically what he told me was like, I want you to benefit the people and benefit humanity. And in our organization, that's really the mantra. And that's how we tried to orient it. Now, the challenge of that and the challenge of not getting advice is what does that mean in reality? And that's been sort of my journey. And that's really what we're going to speak to a little bit as a management team is like how we have thought through that. Because what happened initially was we, it, we probably aired one way or another too much where people thought maybe we're not being authentic enough to our mission that he sort of charged us with. And sometimes we were impractical in trying to deliver on the mission in a way that wasn't sustainable and wasn't gonna allow us to continue on 
um, as an ongoing concern. And even within the company, you have to sort of clarify that because it can cause tension, especially as we've grown. When I started, we had 15 people. Now we have, I think we're approaching 220. Um, the debates are now not always inclusive of me because the decision-making is now spread out. So you have to be able to convey things in a way that is understandable because otherwise what happens, and we saw this in, in our, um, as we evolved, was people will, will be in a debate about a business decision and will we'll end up with something totally impractical as a, as a solution. The reason is, is someone sort of usurps the authority of the moral high ground, right? And they say like, look, if we're about benefiting humanity, this is what we have to do. And then it leads to a decision where if we do that, we're driving our organization right off a cliff, right? Which is great in the near term because it's fulfilling, but it's just not pragmatic in the long term. So we had to define that. So the way we defined that um, was fivefold. So first and foremost, we empower surgeons like yourselves. Um, you know, I think that we're a technology uh, company and we need to think about how we can contribute, right? We can't actually deliver care like all of you, but our contribution is delivering technology. And because we're not just driven by growth, um, we realize that our specialty is in glaucoma surgical. We've had a lot of opportunities to go outside of that, but I think we have differentiated capabilities in glaucoma surgical because we've developed more products in that space than any other company and we've developed um, products for more anatomical targets than any other company. Secondly, and I, I think this is really important to me personally, um, and I think a lot of folks, I was, I was uh, uh, speaking to one of the providers in the community yesterday, and she was, and I was, I was asking her, because a lot of people, especially um, now in training, it, it's different, where um, they may not want to get involved with managing a practice, and I was asking her about that burden, and she was saying it's really fulfilling to create fulfilling careers for people. And I feel really much the same way. We have 200 families that we support through, um, through our organization. And I think we give them meaningful work and we also provide them hopefully robust um, ways to support their, their life endeavors. We also try to expand access to care. So in the US, that means people who are uninsured or underinsured, um, and we will give no charge products. Internationally, what that translates into is we do give no charge products. Sometimes that can be problematic and that's not sustainable and it actually can cause issues, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, so, but we, but in lieu of that, we all, all the time try to work with our partners to make sure that our pricing internationally is achievable in the local markets so that access is not an issue. We also den, um, donate 10% of our profits. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this today. It's interconnected with the, um, with the rest of the things we do, but I think it's representative of how our thinking's evolved. And finally, we support employee mission trips. So we've had employees, I think one of our, one of our team members um, in, joined you with one of the trips to the Navajo uh, Reserve as well. Um, but we cover 75% of the cost and 75% of the time. And, and that's selfishly, we wanna really ingrain people into our mission and really let them feel it. So every single town hall we have, we have quarterly town halls, we have someone present on something they've done just because, especially for folks that are not in the field, it's easy to get detached from how real the work that we do is and how great a responsibility we have to do it at a really high level of professionalism. So I'm gonna talk about our initial phase and I don't mean to be dismissive about this, but this is like, one of the things I always cringe about is that we are a family business and I feel a little guilty about that because I, a lot of times family businesses become lifestyle businesses. And I think we, we try to be mission driven and true to that, but that's been an evolution too. You know, we have a founder who's a very powerful um, personality in the sense that he is so giving to the point where we as a family have to restrain him at times because it can cause problems. Um, but that was the origin of our, of our evolution. And, that, and it really was a mode of giving. And um, it, was, it wasn't as systematic as maybe someone who like myself would like as far as scaling, but actually it's really special because you have to sort of keep that even as you scale, you don't wanna lose that sort of soul of your organization. But what we did initially, and this is just a sampling of what Dr. Damon did over the years, it would be a lot of times folks that he knew well. So we, we supported a mobile vision screening clinic in, in New York City for, um, for uh, different um, populations that weren't really going to see providers. Um, we supported uh, Anand and I Institute in India, in Hyderabad. We, we were one of the founding donors for that. Um, 
But these are both two individuals that Dr. Ahmed knows, Dr. Al Aswed, who's uh, who was recently at NYU, and then Dr. Ramesh Ayala, who's the chair at UC USF. Um, and, and we supported them, but it was mostly because Dr. Ahmed had a relationship with them. It wasn't necessarily where we were optimizing our impact. Also, we did things personally, and this is something that we've, we've blended away. So our family is of the Islamic faith. So we, we, we funded um, a Masters of Divinity program for the Abrahamic faith. So people who are um, of Jewish background or of a Christian background could study together. And, um, and we also funded a school in South LA um, that would provide a safe environment for kids there. And over time, we continue to be involved with those things, but we've moved those to our personal level because we wanted to connect it better with our organization because we want a coherency. It's, it's a big thing I think about when I think about building out our business is the coherency and the, the reinforcing elements of our business because I think that that's how you create a really powerful organization over time. So we want it to be more systematic and coherent. And what we did is we, we sort of pivoted away from some of the um, emotive giving and personal, personal giving for the family, and we separated that into we can do that separately outside of the organization and try to align with our, our customers and actually our, our, um, our employees as far as our giving moving forward. So we, we launched humanitarian awards and actually Moran was one of the recipients for our project award for your work in Tanzania. And it was a $50,000 award that we gave every year. And we also launched a fellowship award for recent um, glaucoma fellowship graduates that wanted to go on a mission trip. We would provide them travel support. And finally, an outcomes research um, uh, support where we would fund a project that would um, basically go into eye camps and try different techniques to be able to screen people efficiently with, with more pragmatic technology. Um, these were really, I think, impactful in some instances and in other instances, not so much. And we realized that sometimes um, this just doing these sort of one-off projects aren't as lasting as impact. But the big benefit of these awards is it allowed us to receive a lot of applications and really educate ourselves on all the work going on in this space. A lot of the work going on in this space, not all of it. But that, a lot, that informed our, our next step of evolution, how we've been thinking. The other thing we did is we funded um, Orbis's uh, glaucoma platform for CyberSight. And the last thing we did, which I think was incredibly um, impactful, hopefully, was uh, we worked with Cure Glaucoma Foundation, uh, which is the um, charitable arm out of Glaucoma Associates of Texas. And there's a doctor there, Dr. Tosin Smith, who's of Nigerian origin. And um, she led a, a program in Nigeria and it's, it's, it's actually been pretty incredible. So we went in 2019. At that point, there was one surgeon that could do glaucoma drainage devices in the country. And, um, and, uh, and she'd only been doing it for a couple of years. And, and Dr. Smith created a sort of systematic education and um, actually an identification first of the right, of the right partners and then an education program, and then um, a model where we held people accountable for passing on their knowledge. That's expanded the number of surgeons capable of doing these refractive surgeries to 50 in just a couple of years. And, um, and, and she's, she's looking to expand that. But, uh, but, and we also, one thing we did there too, to help incentivize that was we provided financial support. Um, you know, we went there to learn from what they were doing. We provided uh, access to our training systems to help them create a curriculum. To, um, to do remote training and also on-site uh, wet lab training. And lastly, we also have worked with the locals to um, provide product at, at basically cost for us so that um, they have ongoing supply because Dr. Smith told me at the beginning, she's like, I'm not doing any of this with you unless these people have access to the technology long-term because otherwise it's all for none. But with all of that and all those learnings, one thing we thought is we don't think we're optimizing what we're doing yet. So in 2019, we established a donor advised fund. And the reason we did that is we had this 10% profits that we were giving away every year. We felt pressure to sort of just find um, an opportunity to give them, but we didn't think it was as strategic as it needed to be. So what a donor advised fund allowed us to do was segregate that money so no one could accuse us of, of just not giving anymore. Um, so that money can't come back in the company. It has to go to a 501c3. Um, but what it allows us to do is because those funds are now outside of the company, we al it allows us to sort of make a little bit more results-oriented investments, basically milestone-based grants, where we can say like, look, we'll give you this initial funding, we can escalate it if you hit these targets. And that, that allows us to be a more consistent partner because look, our, our business is not guaranteed forever. We're in a technology industry, maybe we get out innovated, maybe something happens. But if we have sort of these segregated funds, it allows us to at least um, ensure that our commitments are met 
to the partners that are dependent on us. And, um, and again, that just speaks, we were looking for one or two locations where we could really indigenize care. That's another thing we saw with the learnings from all of you and what you've done in Tanzania, but also with Dr. Smith's success in Nigeria um, is that the real challenge is not necessarily, or the real opportunity is not necessarily folks from here going abroad, but really cultivating the capabilities locally. And we were looking for one or two locations. So we had an, a series of trips lined up in the spring of 2020. Actually, the first was gonna be right after the AGS slash MAGA convention in DC. Um, and we were, gonna, we were gonna go the next week to Ethiopia and then we were gonna go to uh, Guatemala. We were gonna try to try to look at different sites that we had worked with over the years to find who the right partner was. But obviously that all got delayed because of the pandemic. So in the interim, what we did was we um, made some less, like not as, not as thorough co um, contributions, but something that still were aligned. We open source one of our key collaborators books online. We made a wiki platform with a, with a textbook about glaucoma procedures. We also worked with Dr. Petty. We, we were able to, uh, we were so privileged that he reached out and then we were able to contribute to, their, to the first global outreach meeting you guys did. Uh, supported some international fellowships uh, for folks coming here to further their training and also run an Orbis study in Africa where, um, again, similar to our outcomes research study, they were using um, non-medical staff to screen for glaucoma. And finally, and this is, the, this is the organization right now that we're looking to go deeper in and we're continuing to talk to, uh, we just did a site visit earlier this year, is Hospital de la Familia. Uh, we provided them staffing support to develop their uh, organization. And I'm gonna speak to why we're looking to go deeper with them. So that area, and I wasn't aware of this, but Southern Mexico and Western Guatemala, and I know you guys have done work there before, um, but then I think there, there, there might not have been reliability of the local partner. Uh, but um, they, you know, it's one of the most impoverished areas in our hemisphere. And 70% um, of the kids are malnourished. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's just tremendous need. But one of the unique things is it's historically accessible. Um, there hasn't been the social unrest that some of, some of the other areas like Haiti is, and I know that that's been a challenge for, for some of your projects. Um, and the other thing is, it's actually, we had an established partner there where um, they have 80 plus full-time employees. They have four programs. One is a, uh, um, a, a medical center, which has 20,000 patient visits a year. They also have a child nutrition center where um, kids are admitted for, if they're severely malnourished to recover for four to eight months. Um, and they have some educational programs, but they have an eye center. And the eye center is really well run, but the challenge was always getting providers, right? And that's the thing, like you don't wanna go in somewhere, at least from our perspective, where there's no ecosystem. And here, the unique thing was there was actually an ecosystem and a culture to actually deliver care. The challenge was providing, getting providers to move to Western Guatemala or to be there, um, given that, you know, a lot of these people are highly educated like yourselves, and for personal reasons, it's just not sustainable for them to be um, in a remote area to, to raise their family or further their lives and, um, or find fulfillment um, outside of work. Um, so it, it, it's, always, it's always hard, but, 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 but for us, we thought that there's an opportunity because there is an ecosystem that's reliable that can be sort of leveraged to um, expand care. And this year, um, they are uh, on pace to do 4,400 procedures at that clinic, so, which I think is tremendous. They, they operate seven days a week. But the biggest thing is, again, not to belabor the point, is that they're indigenizing care delivery. So what they did initially was California Pacific was the partner that would fly down and they would fly in, fly out, do some procedures and fly back. But then over time, um, the individual in the back in the picture, Dr. Sorensen, his, um, he, had, he decided that like, look, it needs to be sort of localized the care. And, um, and th so they, they tried to figure out how can they get someone to move to that region of the, of the country. And what they did is they created sort of a pseudo fellowship where um, somebody would be incentivized to move there. They would be compensated for their training, but then they also would have access to some of the leading ophthalmologists from the US that would come down there quarterly and, and spend two weeks there and, and go over procedures there and then do some distance learning. So over those couple of years, they had access to sort of some of the highest level um, uh, trainers in, in the world. Um, and, and this is something that they've continued to leverage. And now they have eight um, local Guatemalans, all women actually, who go there and they have um, facilities where you can stay. So they go there for 10 days at a time and they rotate in and that provides coverage for the whole month. 
And because this model we think is very promising, we're looking to help them continue to build it out and really figure out a way to make sure that it last beyond Dr. Sorensen, who puts his blood, sweat, and tears into it, but how can we help him with our support and contributions to maybe um, make institutionalize this, something that's impactful. And also, it's also impactful in the region because, uh, you know, the people coming out of the training, um, there's, there's huge variations in training in a lot of countries. And in Guatemala, it's no different. There's, some, there's a couple of very good um, training programs but even then, the even in those programs, the surgical volume is not very high. So a lot of trainees come here and they get, a, they get a tremendous amount of surgical volume and they also get exposure to technology that they don't have access to in Guatemala City. So I also think it escalates or elevates the, um, the, uh, uh, the level of care within the country and actually neighboring countries as well, because some of the people that work there are from the neighboring um, uh, nations. So just a couple of thoughts about approaching industry. Now, I only have worked at New World Medical within this space. So this is very biased to that, um, but I'll give you some thoughts and just, just um, some advice about when you approach industry, some considerations. So first and foremost, I encourage everybody this, hold industry accountable. Everyone in industry loves to talk about how they're your partner and that um, they're in it with you for the patient. Well, hold us accountable for all the things that, that you're trying to do because you're, you're investing your time and you're trying to fight the good fight. I think it's, it's very fair to hold the industry accountable for making sure that they're working alongside you. Also, you need to understand your target. So a couple of things about approaching industry, and this is just my perspective, and you know, Dr. Chai and Dr. Petty and Lori, they know a lot more about some of these interactions. But when you look historically at industry, um, the, the projects they'll fund, a lot of times are their projects. They're not, they're not gonna fund brick and mortar. So you have to know what your ask is and if it's the right, if it's the right ask to ask for that party, right? A lot of times what we've seen for international ophthalmology is the brick and mortar is from like patient donations from a, a large patient donor. It's not, necessarily the, it's, it's not necessarily from industry. Also, different companies have different approaches to it. Allergan has a foundation. They'll give a lot of monetary um, contributions from what we've seen. Um, Alcon, for example, is the most... I think generous giver of actual product. I think they, they just, they're just open arms as far as providing supplies uh, for surgery, but they don't necessarily give monetary grants in, 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 in the same um, level. So you need to see, be understanding of what's a practical ask for that organization historically um, in how they're structured. Also identify the right internal advocate. Um, you know, you, you're, in our field, there's a lot of overlap with industry and, um, and providers. Um, but you know, a lot of times it's hard to navigate from the outside who the right person is to motivate it within an organization to get your ask across the finish line. Um, and the way I would advise that is, A, obviously someone who's more senior is always good, but I think also someone who's, um, who's motivated is a big thing because they will find the right person internally. And even if you don't have a connection within a certain company that where you need something for your patients, industry is really well networked. So if you know someone at another company, just ask them. And they can, even if they don't know someone directly, they'll be able to find someone. And then if you find the right advocate, a lot of times you can get the right answer. Uh, uh, but industry can at times be um, a dead end. And it's not because people are not motivated or well-intended all the time. It's because they don't really feel empowered and they actually don't even know where to start within their organization. Also realize you're providing an opportunity. When you're pushing folks, it's actually good because um, they'll be reticent because sometimes they'll be a little insecure about whether they can deliver on whatever they promise for you, but, um, but it will be fulfilling. And I've seen this, like we've pushed different individuals and, and but then it, we see them at the show next time, they're so proud that they, they, they were able to contribute in a way because, you know, um, it's an opportunity for us and it is fulfilling. And I think all of us want to have that sort of self-actualization that we are contributing to something better in society. Now, a couple of considerations from the industry's perspective. Uh, we were talking about this regulatory requirements, um, you know, and, and we've had uncomfortable conversations because we'll have a, a person going on a mission trip and they'll ask for product to be shipped to a certain place. And we'll say, well, we can't do that. And, and they'll get really upset because they look at us, and I get it from their perspective, that we're sort of stopping them from delivering care. But sometimes it actually jeopardizes the rest of our organization because we'll, we have regulatory requirements that we have to comply with. And if we're not actually authorized to ship something into a, 
um, into our region, even if we trust the provider, we could lose our certification in the EU or the US, like those audits are real, right? And, 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 and some, even though the countries are not interrelated, if our, if our quality system, our controls aren't, aren't being adhered to, um, we can get penalized for that. Local partnerships. Um, and this is something that again is a push and a pull. Um, you know, there's different models for delivering um, products and services, uh, but a lot of times you do need a local partner, even if they do take a cost, because that that makes having a local partner allows you to deal with customs, allows you to deal a lot of times with registration. A lot, a lot of these there's localized issues that you need to be able to deal with, and without a local partner, you don't have a sustainable access to. Um, to, uh, to product, and you know, it's just not a sustainable model. In the short term, maybe you can cut costs by cutting them out, but a lot of times um, it, it won't be sustainable long-term, and it's something that you have to be pragmatic. Even if you're trying to make the, the price point achievable in the local market, sometimes that trade-off is just not, it might be good in the short term, but it's just not sustainable in the long term. Also, you can distort local markets. So a lot of times you think you find a really good uh, partner locally, and sometimes they're well-intended, and sometimes they're not necessarily, they are well-intended, but they're also pragmatic with their practice, right? So you'll be giving product at a discounted or a no charge, and we've done this before, and all of a sudden you'll see someone charging for a premium, like glaucoma surgery, and, um, and they're doing it with no cost, and, and, um, and they're benefiting from that, and it's actually penalizing some of their peers. And, and that also causes a lot of pressure on the system, and you're really sort of destroying the ecosystem and not really moving it forward if you're not sort of thoughtful about that. And a lot of times it's hard to look and, and judge that from the outside. You have to have a, a thought partner locally that really can um, understand the dynamics within the market. And last two points is you need to look at the right technology for the right context. Um, you know, when we went to Nigeria, one of the things I offered Dr. Smith was I said like, look, we can go with our whole portfolio. And she was like, no, let's start with the amid valve. And the reason for that is these are the most acute patients and, and these are patients that don't have alternatives where if we go with the Kahook dual blade or we go with some other products that are earlier intervention, there are um, substitute treatments. Um, so she wanted to go with that. And that was a learning for me. And the last thing, and this is something that gets sensitive and we actually are a little shy to push people on this is avoid reframing your standards when you go abroad. Um, and this happens, and it happens in a way that isn't poorly intended. Uh, but we see people trying to use some of our new products the first time on a mission trip. We don't want to add that variable. You're already going into OR that you're not used to operating in, and now you're trying to use new products. Or they're, they use actually a different technology, but then it maybe it's more bureaucratic to go to that organization to get a donation. So they ask us, and we're not necessarily 100% comfortable with doing that either because they're not used to using that technology on a day-to-day -day basis. And then they're going internationally. And, you know, it's just, a, it's a little bit of a slippery slope when you don't control a lot of the variables. So hopefully this was useful. It's, a, it's our individual sort of experience as an organization, but I, I welcome any questions or comments. So I have a microphone to bring around the audience for those of you that have questions. I think this is a really unique opportunity for us to understand the key role that, that industry partnerships uh, are in our work that we're doing. And so thank you for pulling the curtain back and, and giving us an eye into New World Medical's operations. And one of the questions I have for you is how you guys balance mission and profitability. You are ultimately a business. And while your shareholders are maybe smaller than an actual publicly traded company, um, is it more driven by certain metrics or is it more driven by value? You know, you, you talked about your mission statement of benefiting humanity, uh, but is that really a metric that you're using more versus actually um, profitability metrics? So, yeah, and that's a great question. It's a challenge we have. Um, so we, you can't have multiple priorities. You have to have an order of priorities, right? So we are a business first and we can't, for us to be an ongoing entity, you have to recognize that. And you have to realize that if there's a trade-off, you have to do what's pragmatic for you to be an ongoing entity if you want to contribute. Because we have responsibilities to our employees. We also have responsibilities to the family and the shareholders as well. Um, so the way we try to do that is we, we, we recognize those priorities. But when we set metrics internally, like so our, our vision for 2025 is to reach more patients than any other glaucoma surgical um, company. That works on a business perspective, but it also works on hopefully a mission perspective. We also had one of our goals that we had to walk back was we wanted to increase our product donations by fivefold. Um, but then we realized that um, we can try to 
we can try to give product, but unless there's actually a capability on the ground to be able to deliver that care appropriately, it's, that's not the right limiting factor. So that's how we think about it. It's an ongoing balance, but, um, but you know, I think we contribute in a lot of different things. And that's why we codified it with those five different categories uh, because us to be able to reinvest into technology and to be able to, um, to be able to, uh, to, to bring new products to market is also impactful as well. And that, that drives forward all things. So it, it's a balance at all times. And at times it actually frustrates people too, because this year uh, we took a, a price increase for our Ahmed valve. And like, um, and we did that in the U S and the reason we did that. And, and, and it did make some of our customers very upset, right? Because the, it was actually, there's still a lot of margin on the, um, on the facility fee. Um, but, but we took the price increase so we could continue to reinvest in the organization, right? Um, for us, that's a balanced decision, right? We want to make sure that we're being a pragmatic partner to all of our partners in the U.S., but we also realize it's an insured population. So if we can, if we can drive revenue here, it allows us to do more in other parts of our organization. So it's, it's not a linear answer, it's, but, it, but it's, um, it's something that we're constantly trying to balance. You alluded to the idea of distorting local markets. Can you talk a little bit more about your approach? Maybe you can use a case example from Nigeria or yeah. anywhere you guys have been working and how you establish what a market rate is for your product and how you plan long-term to make that product available in, in, a, in an emerging market. So we haven't always been good about this. Nigeria has been really, really um, easy because Dr. Dr. Smith goes quite a bit. And then the others, there was three doctors that led that. Dr. Tosin Smith, who, I, who mentions is of Nigerian origin, Dr. Lola Adau, who, who is at University of Maryland, who is also of Nigerian origin, and then Dr. Manjul Shah. Um, so because Dr. Adau and Dr. Smith are from Nigeria, they were able to navigate that. And they were also able to navigate the politics because they both went to medical school there. So they have enough connections. So they, were, they, 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 they allowed us to do that. Um, we went back forth on different pricing. Initially we priced at like even lower, um, and then she brought it up because we, if you price at zero, um, people will just stock up and they won't even utilize it too. So, uh, but if, and then sometimes you'll, you'll see the bleed into other countries. So we'll see this a lot of times people will, there's a lot of fraud in certain regions and they'll, they'll say like, look, I'm going to distribute in this, this specific region of say Africa, but then all of a sudden we see them winning tenders in Saudi Arabia, right? So, so, so you see that, right? So you need to make sure that you have some costs associated with it. It also gives that local um, partner, a real sense of partnership because they're actually paying for something. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, like we haven't found a, a direct formula, but in, in Nigeria, we're just deferential to the doctors that were local, right? And if you find a local partner that is a balanced advocate and we were, it's, it's unique because Dr. Smith is based in Dallas, and Dr. Dawu is based in Maryland. Um, so they don't have any sort of biases to, um, to distort the market, uh, but they were able to, to guide us on that. And in other regions are, if you find the right distributor, and a lot of times that's not the easiest thing because there's only so many ophthalmic distributors, um, you have to be relying on them as a partner. And sometimes you have to be a little skeptical of their advice and you have to sort of at least be informed of the doctors as well. Any questions from our audience? Uh, thank you again, Bilal. This is uh, really lovely. And thank you for your you know, support to, to Moran and to global ophthalmology community. Uh, it, you know, you, you've been around long enough in this space to see, um, again, these kind of unintended consequences, you know, um, surprises as people, you know, with best intentions uh, enter into the space. And uh, if you could give, you know, uh, one piece of advice to uh, residents, fellows who are really interested in engaging, what would that be? So this is a little bit sensitive. I don't know how to frame it 100%. But um, you know, one thing about, um, I didn't know Dr. Crandall well. Um, but I, every time I met him, you, know, he, you could see the sincerity, the way he looked at you. It, he like validates you as a person. And that's, that's very rare, right? That's very rare of, uh, of um, an individual, especially someone who's been very successful. And Dr. Ammon's got that too. But I think the thing about them and it, that I've learned and, and a lot of people here is, it can't be about you. It can't be about only your fulfillment. Like all of us do stuff. Everything, everything we do in our life is about our fulfillment too, right? But it has, you have to have an intellectual sincerity of when you're doing work, right? And I think that even in outreach, I think we see this, there's a lot of, um, 
for lack of a better term, egos. And that sometimes that drives to people not wanting to learn best practices from each other, not, not trying to reinvent the wheel all by themselves. And I think if you can sort of balance that desire to maximize your contribution with that sort of intellectual sincerity to finding the best path forward, I think that's the balance that, you, that, that I would look for. And for another question for you, you were, I alluded a little bit to your background as an actuarian. Maybe tell us what an actuarian is in a nutshell. Okay. And then I have a question in terms of how that actually shapes your role as CEO of, of a company. Okay, so I, I guess the easiest way to think about what an actuary does is it's, it's um, like, so what an accountant does is they value stuff in the past and the present. What an actuary does, is they value stuff in the future. So if you think about insurance, like health insurance, I, I, I specialize in pensions and investments. Um, th those are things where you're using like um, data sets to sort of predict in a large population, like what's going to happen and how you can price that accordingly. So at least the decision making financially. So as an actuarian and, or an, and a CEO of a company, are you tending to more drift towards data to help in your decision making? Or are you more driven by the mission of your company? Because I think they're yeah. sometimes competing. Yeah. In terms of raw numbers that can drive you and in, in understanding yeah. risk. Uh, but as a CEO, sometimes you're called upon to take some yeah. some risk to drive yeah. your company forward and innovate. So I was not a great actuary. So I, I, I did get fully qualified and stuff like that. So but I was a skeptical actuary. And I think that um, what it what it led to was you can't trust numbers. I think people the only thing you know about your projections as an actuary is that they're wrong. Right. <laughs> like they could they can be directionally right, but they can be wrong. So I think there's a lot of fallacies in decision-making. And I think that that's something that it did raise awareness for. And, and the way we think about a lot of decisions, people ask us, and they, a lot of times, especially in my role, they wanna see a vision that's like, we're gonna go A, B, C, D, and this is the direction we're going forward. And my answers are always a little bit more circuitous because I think you have to look at things through frameworks. And I think that that's the right way of saying like, look, here's our order of priorities, or here's how we think about this different, um, these different types of different issues. And even the way we build out our organization, we, we're, we're pretty dogmatic about that. We think about activity systems and, and that's how we think about how we develop as an organization. So I think starting my career as an actuary just made me a little bit um, skeptical while people being overconfident with analytics. So maybe, maybe it actually went the opposite direction in a way. <laughs> awesome, any other final questions for Bilal? Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I just had a quick question about uh, local partnerships again, and uh, you mentioned uh, a lack of sustainability if you don't partner. Uh, specifically, you mentioned uh, customs uh, and the difficulty that that can present. I was wondering if you had any other uh, examples or maybe uh, experiences that you can share on on, on how uh, be not sustainable over time. How it, it cannot be sustainable. So, you know, one, I'll, I'll give you an example of what is sustainable. You can find loopholes around it, right? So, so sometimes you import into a country and there can be, um, there can be exemptions. And we were, we were just talking about that. So in Nigeria, what happened is there's an eye foundation, which is a, a major hospital there. So they, and they're a pretty good partner, but they also have an exemption where they can get importation of devices that are not necessarily approved through the government um, through their foundation and they can distribute them through there. So you can find end arounds, but as far as sustainability, that that isn't a lot of time. We we've partnered with physicians. Uh, no offense to physicians, but we partnered with physicians in certain markets, and um, as our distributor, and that's that's turned out poorly for us historically because what we see is that there's always politics, and um, and that is leveraged there, or somebody got in an argument with somebody at some point, and all of a sudden they have a special pricing that may be three times the price of everyone else, right? So so we do we do see that that you have to have a local partner. We've even seen, um, you know, one of the countries we struggle with, and I think every country struggles with, every company struggles with is Brazil, because Brazil has 100% import tax. So when you go there, like, so when we go with an Amid valve in Brazil, we're selling it to, to, into Brazil at $250. The, the receipt for our distributor is $500. At one point, our distributor is starting $1,600 for an Amid valve there. And we sort of had to have a conversation saying like, look, you can't make more money than we do as an organization. We actually produce a product. Um, and, and, and that can be, that can get out of control too. So you have to, you have to be savvy, um, but there's a lot of politics. So you get feedback within a country and sometimes it's hard to discern what's actually substantiated and objective and what's not. So again, more art than science, unfortunately. 
Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. <clears throat> We're gonna transition now, just some brief highlights. Uh, Lori McCoy is our Director of Global Outreach here. And I think many of you know about the work that we're doing, but we're just gonna give you some context, give you some numbers for the impact that we've had this year. Okay, so thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk and my, um, this is kind of a recap of the last year of the things that we have done as far as outreach. So to start off, I have a QR code for everyone to download because we're gonna play a game. So see how much, no how knowledgeable you are with the game. You can make up whatever you want. That's the fun part about it. Okay, I'm waiting for everyone to join. There you go. Fourteen. Even those who are online can also join the game if you were able to scan the QR code. Okay, so we have 17 players, 19 players. 20 players, 20, 21, okay. The names, Corner Bakery, we got, okay, 21 players. Right, I think we're, anybody else who needs to still join? Oh, so many players, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna start the quiz so we can get moving. I think we have 20 or 21 getting there. Okay, so start the quiz. Question number one, how many total clinics do you think that outreach has held in the past fiscal year of 21-22? You're on a timer too, so you only have a certain amount of questions that you get to ask, answer. Okay. So 65 to 70 and there you go. There's your leaderboard. Those are all correct. And next question. Question number two. How many physicians have been involved in our work? And there's Dr. Crandall. When he brought that up today, I'm like, oh. He's... He's up. All right. Very good. I do. He's in the lead. Next question. How many patients have we seen in our clinics? This is locally and internationally. There you go. Next question, number four. How many patients have had surgeries at Outreach has helped set up? Five. How many international trips has Varan and adjunct faculty done in fiscal year 22-23?
É talvez que eu vou ir. Okay, how many total how many total hours of outreach volunteers have given in 22 23 how many different types of surgeries have outreach patients received Okay, eyeballs, whose eyeballs has won the game? Whose eyeballs? Are they somebody who is here in the room? <laughs> Rachel, yay, the winner is Rachel. Okay, so, so thank you. Um,